mother told me someday I would buy galleys with guns. You've never used them before. My mother told me someday I would buy galleys with good oars, sail to distant shores. Stand up in the prow, noble Margasil, steady course for the haven, humany foemen, humany foemen. That can't be aircraft. Aircraft can't maneuver like that. How else could they be? I don't know, lasers maybe. Now sci-fi becoming reality. With the formation of a permanent government office tasked with investigating unidentified aerial phenomena, also known as UFOs, it's all part of a bipartisan backed amendment buried in the National Defense Authorization Act, spearheaded by Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. I really see this as trying to know what is knowable. One Stanford researcher looking at the brain scans of some service members who say they've encountered UFOs, astrophysics professor Avi Loeb co-founding the Galileo Project to invest in high-tech telescopes, infrared cameras, and specialized AI software hoping to collect scientific data on the kinds of mysterious objects that have been spotted by fighter pilots who say they seem to break the laws of physics. The answer to this question will have huge implications for the future of humanity. It will affect our aspirations for space, and it basically affects each and every aspect of human life here on Earth. We are at a turning point in human history. Earlier this year, the Pentagon was forced to officially confirm UFO sightings after investigative filmmaker Jeremy Corbell obtained videos of unexplained activity. The recordings were government-filmed sightings of UFOs being studied by the US Department of Defense. Since This occult alchemical symbol represents a planetary alignment that is believed to have occurred in primeval Earth. The pre-ringed Saturn, the primordial Sun, was stationed in a fixed position in the north in conjunction with our closest neighboring planets, Venus, the Morning Star, and Mars. These celestial bodies represented humanity's earliest gods during the Golden Age of Atlantis, a highly advanced utopian civilization ruled by immortals who through science and philosophy created a most perfect society. We know these immortals as the Watchers from Genesis chapter 6. The Platonian vision of Atlantis, which this celestial alignment symbolizes, is at the heart of the ruling elite's nameless ancient mystery religion of Babylon, we know as the cult of Saturn or the cult of the Black Sun. It is believed that our planet has been ruled for centuries by the high priests and sorcerers of this satanic Freemasonic pagan solar cult. It's a brotherhood that strives toward the rise of their dark primordial sun, whom they call the New World Teacher. It is this counterfeit messianic figure who they believe will usher in their new global utopian vision of the new Atlantis. This is a really important time in our human history. We are at a turning point in human history. Huge implications for the future of humanity. The UFO phenomenon is a, it's a global phenomenon. There are reports of encounters in all 194 countries across seven continents. This is not just a US issue, this is a global issue. is the big picture what are the what is the takeaway of your story after you're gone you're not a, a rebel kid with a with a jet car at los alamos today today's a different bob lazar right right but what have we learned what's what's the message of your story what's the big thing is the suppression of extremely advanced technology and the suppression of unknown science that's it the big question are we alone it's the number one question right. there's two questions right what happens when we die and are we alone 
Those are the two big questions. Right. What these, do you say? You, you want to run a government? You want to get people to pay their taxes? But there's something else. Yeah. Because, what, so, what do you say? So you have these objects fine with impunity, right? And you, you have something else. Well, not only that, Ooh. what can you say? Like, how much do you really know? I think it's exactly. mainly the technology. That, they just want to keep the technology secret because military. if there's... Yeah. Whoever yeah. gets this There's wins, a, dude. Yeah, they win. they, you you right. control the where you become you literally become invincible once you master the technology. You can't you cannot penetrate a field like that. So imagine that's I know it's all science fiction, but science fiction turns into science fact. If you have real force fields around aircraft and battleships, you you win. You win. You can right. force your will upon anybody. Is someone else here? Maybe visitors interested in us, in our genes, in our souls. Maybe we're property, just a commodity. We're like livestock. Maybe they'd like our condors and cupcakes, a kimono or the top of the bug nose. Or maybe every single sighting of things in the sky is a product of our collective consciousness. I don't like telling this story. I don't like telling this story because it's impossible to tell it without people immediately assuming that you are some attention-seeking, totally woo-woo insane person or a disinfo agent, or quite frankly, just a liar. I can guarantee you that I am none of these things. I'm going to put my credibility and my reputation on the line, and I'm going to tell you what happened to me and my family almost 30 years ago. But I'm going to ask you to make a commitment. The account that I'm about to unfold for you, you're gonna think I'm either making it up or I'm a nutcase. Stay with it anyway. Stay with it to the end. I can assure you that everything I'm about to tell you is absolutely 100% true. I'm going to recreate an event for you that began on August 30th, 1991, and ended on February 3rd, 1994. These memories are forever burned into my brain, so this is not a challenge. When I'm finished, I will give you my own analysis of what happened, and it will not be what you expect. Every year on Labor Day weekend, my then-husband and myself, along with our roommate of many years, and a group of friends would all go on this big camping trip. There were a few places that we like to go, but this year we decided upon Lake Comanche. Comanche is a man-made lake in the San Joaquin Valley, located in Northern California. Our families would plan these trips weeks in advance, always the same group, along with our kids, we'd bring our boats and jet skis. These trips were a lot of fun and I enjoyed them very much. This particular trip, I had just had my first baby three months prior. Everyone assured me it was safe to bring him, so we made the trip. Comanche was my personal favorite, mostly because you could set up camp right on the water's edge. The first day, we got there late Friday afternoon and got everything all set up. Our campsites were all in a row and right at water's edge, with a small boat dock directly in front of us. We had reserved a row of sites so we could all camp together. The place was super empty, hardly any people there at all, and nobody in our camping area at all except us. But it was still early and we expected it to fill up the next day. At the end of the first day, we hung out with everyone a while, and after everybody went to bed, we ventured off to our own vehicle, which was my husband's work van with a bed all made up inside. Our roommate shared our campsite and set up a tent close by. I had gone to bed. My infant son was sleeping next to me inside the van. The side door was open and I could see the campfire nearby and the lake just beyond. My husband and roommate stayed up and talked a while, but I pretty much drifted right off to sleep. The next day was glorious, sunny, clear blue sky, glistening water, crisp clean air. We all had a good full day of activity. Now after dinner and after all the kids went to bed, the usual was for all of us grown-ups to sit by the fire and talk, party a little, maybe do some night fishing. On every one of these trips, it was almost like routine with us. But it was strange because on this particular night, everybody went to bed. Our entire entourage went to bed super early. They all went back to their RVs, turned out their lights, and went to sleep. The sun hadn't even gone all the way down yet. Extremely unusual for our group because we were a bunch of partiers. I wondered if something was wrong. Seriously, like were they mad at us? What's going on? I asked my husband what was the deal and he just shrugged. He didn't know. I felt as if I was out of the loop on something. We never crashed early on these trips. Never. The only ones left awake were myself, my husband, and our roommate. So the guys went out to the dock to sit in the boat and fish and I found myself kind of standing there all alone all of a sudden. I had put my baby to sleep so I set up a chair nearby to sit and watch the sunset and then after I wanted to just stargaze. I was within earshot of my son so I could hear him if he would stir or wake 
Everyone was within eye and earshot. There was probably 30 yards between where I was sitting and where the boat was docked, and probably 10 or 15 feet between where I was sitting and where the van was parked with my baby inside, the door open so I could see him. The sun was disappearing behind the horizon, and I remember thinking to myself, wouldn't it be amazing if we saw a UFO tonight? I wasn't a Christian then. Thoughts like this weren't foreign to me. I'm from Generation X. My parents were products of the 60s counterculture, so the world had at least a good two decades of worldview shaping and programming accomplished in me by that point. Little did I know that what was about to unfold would be the catalyst that would eventually lead me to the cross. So while I'm sitting there, an F-16 fighter jet appeared out of nowhere and blazed across the sky directly overhead. It was flying low enough that I could see detail and the single burner aglow at its rear as it passed overhead. We had attended nearly every Blue Angels air show at Moffett Field up to that point. This was not a Blue Angel. It was gray and unmarked. What in the world was an F-16 doing flying over Lake Comanche right now? I yelled over to my roommate, you guys see that? Yes, I did, he said slightly confounded. Is there a base nearby, I asked. Neither of the men knew the answer. The sun was almost all the way down now, and the stars began to emerge in the night sky. About 15 minutes had passed when another F-16 peeled across the sky directly overhead in pretty much the exact same flight path. Was it the same one? I yelled over to my roommate. Did you see that? What in the world? Yes, I sure did, he said a bit puzzled. I heard them talking amongst themselves in the boat, though I couldn't make out what they were saying. Some time had passed, and now it's completely dark. I just wanted to relax and stargaze, to unwind and stare into the night sky. Something appeared in the sky in my periphery, just over the ridge, back over my shoulder to the left. It looked like two big headlights in the sky, like a small plane, a Cessna maybe, right over the ridge line and headed this way. Why was it descending? Is it trying to land here? As it neared, I walked over to the van and grabbed a set of binoculars off the dash. Hey you guys, I called out to the men. You seeing this? What is this? I could hear them mutter something to each other. They were probably annoyed with me and began walking this way. They came around to the front of the van where I was standing and looked upon this aircraft along with me. My husband wanted the binoculars, but they certainly were not needed. This thing was close, like two bright white headlights slowly descending and without any sound coming right over toward us on our side of the lake. We watched for quite some time. It was moving too slow to be an airplane and much too quiet. The thing made no sound that we could hear. Each of us took turns with the binoculars. We all stood and stared as its forward movement slowly came to a halt. It hovered there for what seemed like several minutes and then suddenly the headlights turned off. Behind the lights was a single row of multicolored lights. Each light in the row was a different color, but each bulb, if that's what you want to call it, was also cycling through a series of colors, sort of morphing into each different color. There was no blinking or patterns, just a row of colored lights with each light cycling through all of the colors. Strange colors, not ones that our eyes have never seen or anything like that, but certainly not colors you'd see on a commercial aircraft. We just stood there watching this thing, and it sat there for a really long time, seemingly staring right back at all of us. At least 20 minutes went by, and I was a good bit creeped out at this point. Clearly this was something we'd never seen before, and it remained stationary for all this time. I was feeling very uneasy and also a bit concerned for my baby. It was weird, and I was not liking this at all. Then, a strange projected image appeared about 100 feet away from us. It looked just like the projection on a movie screen, but with no screen. Just this transparent projected image, perpendicular to the ground, like a flat, two-dimensional, rectangular-shaped hologram. We were standing there staring at this thing in utter disbelief, no longer looking at the blinking lights in the sky above us. We were out in the middle of nowhere. There is no electricity on this side of the lake. You have to remember, this was nearly 30 years ago. It wasn't built up there like it is now. There wasn't anything out there then. On the projected image was a strange dot matrix pattern moving silently across the face of it. The image was about two or maybe three car lengths long and maybe 15 feet high. It's hard to say because we weren't sure exactly how far away it was from us and none of us were willing to run up there and check it out. It just appeared there and we stood there dumbfounded watching it. My husband said quietly to our roommate, that's the same thing we saw last night over the water. I began to freak. I said, what? You saw this last night? Why didn't you say anything? They said, yeah, over the water at the other side of the lake and they gestured in that general direction. 
I told my husband that this was really freaking me out and I wanted to go home. To get me and our baby out of there and to take us home right now, let's go. He refused and just stood there staring at it. My husband was one of those, you know, badass fearless types. I didn't scare easily either, but this was a little beyond reasonable. And having a newborn baby in tow kind of changes the whole game plan when it comes to risk taking. But the men just stood there watching. All three of us just stood there watching this thing. I would find out later after the investigations were complete that what each of us saw on that projected image was something entirely different. We all saw a different image moving across the face of this thing. I saw the dot matrix pattern. Our roommate saw dancing girls sort of along the lines of the Rockettes. My husband saw what looked to be very small children sort of jumping around and playing. But in those minutes, as we stood and watched, in my mind, we were all seeing the same thing. Strange dots appearing across a projected screen out in the middle of nowhere where there is no electricity or nobody else around. And again, you have to remember, this was 1991. And long before tech gadgets capable of doing something like this were available to the general public. After several minutes, this image began to fade, similar in the way a rainbow would fade in the sky. Like at first it's there, vibrant and bright, and then slowly it just gets harder and harder to see. That's the way this thing was. About 30 minutes or so passed, and then it was just not there anymore. After the image had completely disappeared, a very bright glowing ball appeared in the leaves of the nearby tree, off to the right where the image had appeared. It was a phosphorus glow-in-the-dark green, very bright and glowing, and it just seemed to sort of float back and forth in the area of the leaves of this tree. I'm not exactly sure of its size. The trunk of the tree was about two feet wide, I would say, and from our vantage point, the glowing green sphere was wider than that by at least half. Back and forth it went, floating back and forth, and by now I'm borderline hysterical. I was now officially completely freaked out. I had a newborn baby to think about. That's it. I want to go home. A ways off in the distance, two people were walking down a path moving in this general direction. You could barely hear them talking like normal conversation. There were restrooms somewhere up that way in that general direction. Maybe that's what they were looking for. The moment their voices were within earshot, the glowing orb stopped dead in its tracks, scurried downward along the trunk of the tree, passed along the ground just a few feet, and then vanished into thin air. The people walking were seemingly oblivious as they walked along the path until it sort of curved around and out of sight. I was crying now. <laughs> I was now crying. I wanted to go home. I didn't understand what was happening. The blinking lights were still in the sky above like it was standing up there just watching us. My husband had the binoculars and was panning and searching the sky and other ships were coming towards us. First one from behind, then two more on the other side, all flying toward the lake overhead in a semicircular formation then stopping before they got over the water and standing there, just hovering there, standing there. I'd never seen anything like it. It was strange and it felt like something big was about to happen, like something major. And I did not want to be there when this whole thing went down. But my husband was compelled. He just stood riveted and watched. So I was like, screw you guys. I got inside the van, locked all the doors as if to offer whatever level of protection to my baby and myself that I could as this strange fleet of unknown craft slowly gathered for some UFO showdown at Lake Comanche. I had no problem leaving the men outside to revel in their unfettered curiosity as long as they wished. My husband had a key. He could open the door if he needed to. However long this thing transpired from like just before sundown until about three in the morning, my husband and roommate counted 14 craft, not counting the fighter jets. While I was laying there inside the van next to my baby, I was just laying there in the dark inside this van trying to process everything that was going on. A thousand rapid fire thoughts racing around and ping-ponging all over the inside of my brain. I mean, I went through every catastrophic scenario. Were we going to be abducted? What were they gathering to do? Apparently, the men sat up all night watching these things. And at some point, I fell asleep. I don't know how. When I woke a few hours later, I flatly insisted that we leave. I began packing our things and putting them into the van. I put my foot down, as they say. And the men relented and we broke camp. Our friends asked why we were leaving, completely and utterly oblivious to all that had occurred during the 
night as they slept. I don't know what they were told by the men, but I told them straight out to their face that we saw some very weird things in the sky last night and here on the grounds and I'm going home. You guys can stay if you want to, but I'm out of here. I'm gone. I still remember the puzzled looks on all their faces as I adamantly and hurriedly packed our things to get us out of there as quickly as possible. This was the day before Labor Day, Sunday, September 1st, 1991. After we got home, I began to think of who would I call to report what we had seen. My roommate suggested the local news stations. You know, we hadn't had the luxury of the internet yet for a simple Google search. I called information and asked the operator for the number of our local news stations. I made a couple of calls when someone told me to call an organization called MUFON, and they gave me their phone number. MUFON. Mutual UFO Network. Okay, I've never heard of them. So I called, gave my information, and they said a field investigator would call me back, which one did. He wanted to set up a time to come and interview the three of us. On the day of the interview, the field investigator came to the house. He said he wanted to interview each of us separately, so one by one each of us took our turn while the others left the room. He asked us to describe what we had seen, and then had this lengthy questionnaire for us to fill out. I had drawn some sketches of the area, sort of mapping out everything that we saw, and he kept those. And when it was done, he bagged up our questionnaires, shook our hands, and went on his way. He said that the interview was complete, but that he or someone from his district might contact us if they needed more information. We said that was fine, done. Some time had passed when I received a phone call from a man named Virgil Staff. Virgil was a regional director for MUFON for, as I understood it, the Northern California area. He wanted to speak with us about picking us up and driving us back up to the lake so we could show him from ground to zero, so to speak, how the event unfolded. None of us wanted to go. I really didn't want to go. We were all done with it. It was creepy and wild horses couldn't drag me back up to that lake again. The men flatly refused and somehow Virgil talked me into it and I agreed to go and it looked like I was going to be going alone. They picked me up in a van that looks very much like this photo. The field rep sat in the front passenger side and Virgil drove. In the back was myself and Virgil's wife, this petite woman named Leveda. Short cropped hair, friendly face, and off we went. Now the lake was about a two hour drive from where we lived. Along the way, Virgil offered plenty of conversation, general stuff, intermingled with some old-fashioned UFO stories. I was totally overhearing about UFOs. Actually, the entire idea terrified me, and I wanted nothing to do with any of it. But he was also a railroad guy, a railroad enthusiast, and a historian. So he uh, talked about that quite a bit. Virgil was a respected and well-known train historian, and also known for his cheesecake photography of trains and young women. I've read that these girls were actually his students when he was a high school history teacher whose parents had signed model releases allowing him to use them in his photos which were published in a monthly railroad magazine. Virgil is also a graduate of Berkeley, California. When we arrived at the lake and started down the last dirt road to get to the campsite, my anxiety just kicked into high gear. I really didn't want to be there. I mean, and it was broad daylight. It was in the middle of the day. <laughs> and I still really didn't want to be there. They all assured me that everything would be fine and that this whole thing wouldn't take very long. So we drove down to the campsite and the field investigator had pulled out my sketches. And I was surprised that they had them. Virgil commented on how accurate they were, which I felt flattered by that. I pointed out everything that we saw in the order that it occurred. I asked them what they thought the projected image was. What was it and what was it doing there? Virgil said, well, it was probably cloaking whatever was going on behind it. The other two nodded in agreement. The field investigator took a few notes and we wrapped it up and then we hit the road. The ride back was strange. I felt anxious and uneasy. Being back to the site and talking about what happened stirred it all up again for me and I was a little upset. Virgil wanted to stop and take us somewhere to eat, his treat. And this is where it gets weird. My memory gaps quite a bit here. And I have a photographic memory, so my memory doesn't gap. Like, it literally does not gap. There are huge chunks of memory here that is just gone. I vaguely remember pulling up to a restaurant, but I have zero memory of getting out of the van. I remember sitting at a small table in a dimly lit corner of the place. I remember seeing a waitress and a menu, vaguely, and ordering a cheeseburger, which is pretty typical for me to order. I remember the plate before me and seeing the food on the plate, but I have zero memory of eating it. 
All I remember was the three of them, Virgil mostly, telling me all of these super intense UFO conspiracy stories, pretty scary ones actually. His delivery was gaining in intensity and the three of them were sort of chiming in and kind of coming at me. Wild tales of government psyops and secret experiments and beings from outer space and rapid fire stories and accounts and I could barely process one thing before they were filling my head with something else. It was overwhelming. It was way too much information coming at me way too fast. I was getting confused and disoriented. The stories were scary, intense, and I wanted them to just shut up. Like I don't need to hear all this stuff, you know what I mean? I just remember feeling my head spinning from all of it. I couldn't keep up with everything they were saying and I was feeling disoriented, almost displaced or dissociated. Try to remember, this was long before the internet, long before YouTube and, you know, videos and the truther movement. I was an avid reader and a science buff and a sci-fi nerd, but this was way, way, way over the top stuff. This was way before, you know, any of this stuff was in our stream of consciousness, at least for me. So this was blowing my mind. These guys were blowing my mind and they were just pushing this stuff at me hard and fast and coming at me with way too much and it was blowing my mind. And I was disoriented. I have zero memory of leaving that restaurant or getting back in the van. My memory picks up again when we are back on the highway going down the road, heading home. I'm again in the back seat with Leveda and she was seated on my right and she started telling me her own story. I didn't want to hear it. <laughs> I didn't want to hear her story, but I sat there and listened. What were my choices? Where was I going to go? She was telling me about how she saw the little greys at the foot of her bed. She said they would visit often and take her eggs from inside her, then go and make hybrids from her eggs. Then they would sometimes come and abduct her and take her onto some ship and show her her hybrid babies. I asked her, didn't she want it to stop? And she said, oh, I could make it stop anytime I wanted to. Then she gently put her hand on my wrist, looked at me square in the eyes, our eyes locked, and said, all I had to do was recite the Lord's Prayer. And boom, in that instant, her eyes opened really, really wide, and the irises of her eyeballs shrunk down to tiny black dots. Extremely startled, I recoiled, snatched my hand back, and jumped back as far away from her as I could, as far as the van walls would let me. Whoa, what the... In that same instant, her eyes went back to normal, and she returned to this sweet little smiling lady again. Now I'm in a tailspin. The anxiety is pegged off scale. We were barreling down the highway and probably had another 45 minutes left to go. I couldn't jump out. I was afraid to ask them to stop. I was trapped. I just sat there in frozen astonishment. All the small talk and conversation the three of them were making, and they acted like nothing had ever happened. I mean, here I was, like, I had totally snapped back and completely recoiled from this woman, and it was like nothing ever happened with these people. And all the small talk and conversation the three of them were making as we drove down this highway had become muted mumbles to me. My ears just roared and pounded with the sound of my own blood. Once we got to my driveway, I jumped out of the van and headed toward my front door. They wanted to come in and tell us some more stuff. I was like, no, I'm pretty tired now and I have to go and take care of my baby. And I went inside and they sat in the driveway what seemed like two or three minutes before they finally backed up and drove out of our cul-de-sac. The guys were in the kitchen when I walked in and asked me how it went and my head was spinning. I was disoriented still, I was overwhelmed, I was exhausted. I said they were telling me all kinds of crazy stuff and my roommates wanted to know uh, what they were telling me and honest to God, I could not extract even one piece of information that they told me. I couldn't recite even a tiny snippet of what these people were saying to me. It was gone. It was mayhem and confusion. I could tell you the gist of small portions of it, but specific discernible data, gone. I had nothing. Now here's the thing. I thought we were done. I made the report. I went over and beyond showing these people what we saw. As far as I was concerned, it was over. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't want to think about it anymore. But here's what started to happen. Suddenly, I was afraid to be alone in my house, especially at night. I didn't want to stargaze anymore or even be outside at night at all. I'm no looking at the night sky, period. Too scary. And Virgil kept calling me. Each time he would call, he wanted me to describe in more detail what we had seen. He called several times over the course of a few short weeks, and each time he would call, it would increase my anxiety. And I'd have to rehash and rehash and rehash and rehash. And it was almost like an attempt to, to 
confuse my memories about what I saw because after you tell it over and over and over and the way he was asking me over and over and over I started to feel like I wasn't sure what the hell I saw and I told him that every time he would call I would be very very anxious and I told him that I told him that this upsets me and I don't want to think about it anymore but he kept calling and he kept asking for more Finally, he happened to call one afternoon when my dad was visiting. I saw on the caller ID that it was him and I said to my dad, I don't want to talk to this man. He will not leave me alone. So my dad answered the phone and told him, look, you're scaring my daughter. She's told you everything she knows and now it's time to stop calling. You have enough. And that was the last time I heard from Virgil's staff. Around that time, I had started taking some night classes. This way, my husband could stay with our son and I would get home around 10 o'clock every night. About three months have passed since our UFO sighting and I hadn't heard from Virgil or any creeps from MUFON and I was starting to calm down to not think about it so much. This one particular night, I pull up in my driveway after class and wouldn't you know it, one of those multicolored craft were directly above our house. It was much farther up in the sky than I remembered from the night at the lake, but it was there, standing there in the sky, literally directly over our house, and my heart sank. I knew if I went into that house and told my husband what I saw, he would refuse to come out and look at it, so I lied to him. I told him the car was making a weird noise and I needed him to come out to listen. And once outside, I turned him around, pointed to the sky, and showed him what was up there. And he said, yep, there it is again. And he went back in the house. So I went running into the kitchen and opened the drawer where I had left the business card with the field investigator's phone number on it. I called him up. I said, there's another one of those ships right over our house right now. He said he was in San Mateo, but he was on his way. That it would take him a while to get there. We lived in Milpitas, California, which is Silicon Valley right next to San Jose. I locked up the house. I brought the baby from his crib into my bedroom with me, shut off the lights and went to bed. I was having none of it. The next day he called me and said by the time he got there it was gone and I was relieved it was gone but I didn't care. I don't care. I didn't care anymore. What followed after for just over two years our family went through an ordeal that is near impossible to describe. Lots of paranormal type activity going on in the house, some very strange occurrences and events. The psychological wear and tear it put on our family was astronomical. A short time after we saw the multicolored craft above our house, I had received a postcard from Virgil's staff in the mail. As you can see, there is no postmark or postage, which to me suggests someone who is not a postal carrier put it in our mailbox. Had Virgil been to our house again? For me, this was like a slap in the face. I was aggravated to get this postcard. He was asked repeatedly to stop contacting me, so this postcard, in my mind, was a violation of the boundary that I had very clearly set. After all the contact with Virgil's staff and his phone calls, which bordered on harassment, and now the sighting over the house, I was highly disturbed by this entire thing. Now it had become personal, and Virgil had my head all twisted up over this thing. Today I realized that the tactic that he used in the restaurant that day coming back from the lake was a form of hypnosis. The three of them coming at me in this sort of rapid fire intensity in the restaurant, everything he was saying to me on the phone, his delivery, keeping it constant in my mind, making me rehash it over and over, asking me strategic questions over and over, attaching all this disturbing high strangeness to what we saw that scared me half to death, information that I did not ask for nor welcome in any way, all of that. Virgil staff was using a type of hypnosis coupled with a method of programming, a type of mind control. I was told the rhythmic shouting and the constant threats, that's a form of hypnosis. Uh, when, did it, when did this happen? Well, this happened almost immediately. Not only did it change my perception of the event, but it created a trauma response and even impacted my entire worldview. Now I was afraid to be alone in my house, especially at night. I didn't want to stargaze anymore, one of my most favorite things to do. 
The sky, my beloved sky, which had once been a safe canopy for me, had become a malevolent wide gate of unknown horror. And there was this presence in the house, always a presence. At first it felt like there were eyes on me, the feeling of being intently watched, this laser beam stare by some silent, invisible observer, somewhere in the room just watching my every move. Quickly the feeling intensified until the presence emanated strongly and fiercely from directly behind me as if a very tall angry man was standing right behind me staring intensely into the back of my head. As time passed, other people mentioned the feeling too. Some friends and relatives would visit and they would mention it. People would comment that our house felt creepy and felt like they were being watched. My mother came to visit and said it felt creepy in her room at night, but it felt like someone was staring at her through the guest room window. Strange things started happening in the house that couldn't be easily explained. One time my husband and I woke up in the middle of the night and all the lights were on in the house. There was a sudden influx of prank calls. We'd hear the phone ring all hours of the night. Sometimes it would ring only once. Other times it would ring and ring and when someone finally answered it, there would be nobody on the other end. On one occasion, the phone rang. I was alone in the house and it was dark out around 9 p.m. And on the other end was this monotone electronic voice just quickly looping through a long string of profane words. Just a long, looping, fast-moving, mechanical string of profanity. I slammed the phone down and took like two or three big steps backwards and away, just staring at the phone on the wall in hopes that whatever evil robot was on the other end was immediately disarmed when the receiver met the hook. One time we woke up to discover the stereo speakers in the living room were oddly turned backward against the wall. Things would go missing and then turn up in odd places. It would start arguments. We started to accuse each other, to be suspicious of each other. And the beeping. There was a strange beeping sound coming from what seemed to be either inside the wall or under the house beneath our bedroom. It would make a single short beep and some time would go by, then another short beep, and it would continue like this all through the night. Absolutely maddening. It sounded like the beep of one of those those old Casio watches some of you might remember only louder as if someone dropped a watch under our bed or under the house or in the attic over our room or maybe even in the backyard it was hard to place because when we followed the sound and thought we got close to it it would beep again and then seem to be somewhere else we timed the space between each beep and it was exactly every 58 minutes then came the nights I would lie in bed and begin to drift off to sleep, and I would hear a sudden, very loud whisper in my ear, sometimes calling me by name, and I'd be jolted awake to find myself either alone in the room or look Get over up. and see my husband over there snoring away. It was a loud, angry whisper, and sometimes I could feel hot breath on my ear. Some months passed and I would have these terrible apocalyptic dreams. I could deeply and intensely feel the terror and devastation and then desolation and utter despair. Enormous terrain obliterating tornadoes and massive earthquakes and tsunamis that would wipe out most of the west coast. Pole shifts and major extinction level cosmic anomalies. Dreams of the devil the size of Godzilla stomping and tearing through our city and, and I'm running frantically to and fro as it's ripping off roofs of houses and knocking over buildings while hunting us down. After I awoke on one occasion, I looked straight ahead and out through my bedroom door into the hallway and this shadowy figure slithered down the wall and out of sight. One of the last dreams I remember during that time, in the dream, I was home with my husband and my baby in this devastating storm, this massive tornado slash hurricane larger than ever recorded was headed our way and I could hear the winds and the wreckage in the distance as it neared. We were in the living room and I put my baby on the floor, except in this dream, this wasn't my son. It was a baby girl, a mystery child. My son was not part of this dream. And I covered her with my body and then my husband laid his body over mine to cover us both as this thing was getting ready to pass right over us. And the noise was deafening, winds roaring hundreds of miles per hour as it obliterated everything in its several miles wide path. I listened as it drew nearer and nearer while contemplating our imminent demise. It came right on us, then passed over, then kept moving onward until after several minutes we couldn't hear the noise anymore. And after it was silent for a little while, we got up and I went to my front living room window and everything outside was utterly leveled. Nothing remained. Everything, the houses, the roads, the cars, the trees, gone. Nothing left but a flat, desolate plain of dirt for as far as the eye could see. And on the horizon in front of me, and sort of off to the right a bit, were three giant planets hanging very large in the sky. And I was just 
just consumed with horror and dread. And I thought to myself, the world is going to be very, very different now. And I woke. That dream felt prophetic to me then and still does today. Decades had passed before I began to get even a glimpse of a working hypothesis of what the Lord might be trying to show me with that dream. And it's not until very recently that I've begun to see this occultic three planets imagery all over the place and I'm just now grasping its significance. I first noticed it in Jack White's Connected by Love video which came out in 2018 and most recently in the Tiger and Buffalo ad for the Metaverse. And it's always connected to this idea that we are one consciousness, all of humanity is connected as one, the one equals the many, we are not individuals, we are not connected to God, we are one giant hive mind collective connected to the cosmos. I first published my UFO testimony way back in 2009, long before the Jack White's music video and the Meta commercial. This planet symbolism keeps showing up in diverse places and they are all connected to a very specific consciousness engineering campaign. Those nightmares might just as well have come out of a Hollywood catalog of natural disaster films. And I'm way more imaginative than that. Why would my mind conjure such horrific dreamscapes that felt so foreign to me, so very different from my normal dream material? I think this was an effect coming from an external source. Virgil Staff's trauma-inducing hypnosis and deeply embedded triggers that somehow exploited a lifetime of worldview shaping through programming and propaganda in the culture. I also believe that some type of EMF device was was placed in our house. Call me crazy if you want to, I totally understand. <laughs> Dr. James Giordano is a professor in the departments of neurology and biochemistry and has a list of credentials eight miles long, including high-level military biosecurity, neurological operations, and cognitive sciences for the Pentagon and DARPA and the IEEE Brain Initiative. These are the people who are learning how to hack our brains, among other things. In 2018, Giordano gave a lecture on modern warfare and neuroscience to military cadets at West Point. In it, he describes several methods that the brain will be used in military, political, and domestic scenarios and how these technologies can be weaponized. So what we're here to talk about today is the fact that the brain is and will be the 21st century battlescape in many ways. You will encounter some form of neurocognitive science that has been weaponized not only in your military career, but in your personal and professional lives. If, in fact, I understand how it is that your brain does what your brain does, I may be able to access your brain and affect your brain indirectly and directly. That said, what are these techniques and technologies that have rendered this capability and, if you will, geopolitical, military, and social power? First, the assessment of neurotechnologies that do exactly as the name would imply. It's not just a question of trying to figure out what makes the brain tick and the way it's built. It's can we get in there to affect the ticking and talking and by affecting the way that brain is built and the way it functions, influence in ways that are kinetic and non-kinetic, the attitudes, beliefs, thoughts, emotions. In other words, the more I know about what makes you tick, the more my interactions can be geared with you to make you tick the way I want you to. We can also utilize these interventional technologies in those ways that may able to directly affect the brain. Probably the one that you've heard about most recently, most contemporaneously in, in the literature, is the possibility to use some form of directed energy to affect physiology peripherally and also to affect the physiology and health of the brain. And of course, there's not a lot that I can tell you about that, although I am one of the researchers on that particular project. But you also have a whole host of other things that can go bump and bang in your brain. We can go further to implant certain brain machine interfaces. These are many of the DARPA programs that you may hear of now. Probably the one that is most, most notorious in a very good sense is something called the N3 program, which is the non-invasive neurosurgical neuromodulation program being run by their program manager, Dr. Al Mundi. The idea here is to put minimal sized electrodes in a network within a brain through only minimal intervention to be able to read and write into the brain function in real time, remotely. Here we can utilize the brain sciences for psychological operations. Most notably, one of the DARPA programs run by the case manager, by the program manager, Bill Kaysbeer. Bill Kaysbeer's program was called Narrative Networks. And one component of the Narrative Networks project was something called Neural Narratives. If we understand how it is that brains and individuals, groups and populations respond to certain forms of imaging, memes, iconographies, engagements, the more we may be able to tailor those things through our psychological operations, propaganda, meso, to be able to engage these individuals in more positive ways or in ways that are more influential to be able to direct their behaviors, their predispositions, and perhaps their engagements with us on a variety of levels from the individual all the way up to the political. And here, once again, let me reiterate what we're talking about on the neuro side are drugs, bugs, toxins, and devices. 
The house felt haunted and demonically oppressed, and I didn't even believe in that stuff back then. The invisible realm was making itself known to me, and it knew me by name. Where does a science-based atheist like I was back then turn for help with the paranormal? The Yellow Pages, of course. There were no listings under paranormal, but I ended up calling a couple of churches, and the first one that answered, I said, this is going to sound nuts, but I think my house is haunted, and we've been through quite an ordeal here, and I think I need to talk to someone. So I set an appointment, and talked to this pastor, and he listened to me as I unloaded the whole ordeal. He just sat there and listened. He didn't look at me like I was a mental case. And inside that office, he offered his thoughts from a biblical perspective and then prayed over me. And I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior and became a Christian that very day. I'd like to report that I made that decision out of love and reverence for the Lord, but to be completely transparent with you, I did it mostly because I was desperate for protection from things I could not see. And Jesus is the name above all names in the unseen realm, the highest authority there is. And I wanted that protection and covering that only Jesus could provide. The pastor gave me a small bottle of anointed oil and suggested that I go from room to room and pray over and bless the house. I'd like to report that all of that immediately cleared the house, but it did not. The presence was still there and just as strong as ever. Nothing had changed, except me, basically. I went back to the pastor, talked to him about it, and he made a suggestion. He told me that Satan is territorial and has a right to stand upon any territory that belongs to him. He told me to clear everything out of my house for which the enemy could claim territory. I grabbed a box of green garbage bags, went from room to room, praying for God to reveal anything in there that had to go, and I started putting things in the bag. I grabbed horror movies we had on VHS, we had an old Ouija board up in a closet, magazines, books, posters, clothing, you name it, anything that if there was even the slightest ungodliness or claim of territory that the enemy could have with it out the door and in the trash it went. I filled several large green garbage bags full of items that day and set them out on the curb for trash pickup. And after the stuff was gone from the curb, the activity stopped. The strong presence and dark oppressive energy, that frazzled feeling, the apocalyptic nightmares, gone. Even the beeping was gone. It was like someone let the sunlight back into the room. The demon Elvis had left the building. We eventually moved out of that house and we moved to Colorado in 1999 and my marriage dissolved a few years later. 